four and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, a form of blood cancer. And the fact that I'm standing here right now in front of you is actually, I think, a miracle. Because if I had this disease at any point in human medical history, I'd be dead. But this picture is kind of odd, don't you think? I'm getting chemo and I'm smiling, and I'll explain why. I was actually resistant to chemo, and it took four months to figure out. So I was getting all the downsides without much of the benefits. I was still running like a, a nine-minute mile in training when I was on the chemo. So the only solution for me was to actually get a maximum potency treatment of chemotherapy, which was also toxic to my heart. So I had to go into the hospital for infusion, and here's my daughter, and she was enamored with being a doctor. I mean, look at the focus. <laughs> Maybe she'll be a student here one day. Lucky enough to be that, I hope. But a few minutes before this picture was taken, I was sitting down with my doctors before I was going to get this infusion. And he told me, you know, the last time we gave this therapy to someone, the response was so bad, I thought he was going to die. <laughs> I had three thoughts in my head. Number one, holy sh shoot, or something like that. We'll keep it clean. Number two was, this is going to be a really interesting day. And the third, unfortunately, was the fact that I had a lot of negative thoughts come into my mind. You know, am I going to survive the day? Am I going to see my daughter grow up? It's pretty overwhelming. And so the doctors and I weren't sure if the treatment was going to actually cure me or kill me. And Here's an unfortunate selfie around that time. You know, one of the low points during this experience was I couldn't even do this, which was feed myself. So there was a moment when I was lying on the couch, and I asked my mom to put a bagel right here. And I had to turn my head to try and eat this bagel. It probably took like 20 minutes. I mean, it was ridiculous. But if you're wondering, I took the bagel down. <laughs> and luckily, I survived. Not only the cancer, but the treatment itself. And to be true, we survived. My wife always cringes when I show this picture, because <laughs> it's, it's, it's our basement. It's not the prettiest basement, but the truth is, what could have made this basement pretty went into founding our company. But I got to work, and the truth was, I'm a nanotechnologist with an engineering background, and uh, I was program managing really complex uh, things in software, data systems. And after coming back from that experience, I just didn't feel the same level of passion. I wanted to take my background and apply it to something more meaningful to me in the life sciences. And so I got to work. To answer kind of a, a key question for me, which is, why did I have to take this, this crazy treatment and not know if the result was going to lead to me living or dying? And so I wanted to answer this simple question. Why are we all guinea pigs? And you know, you've maybe experienced this, and that is, Take a couple of these, come back tomorrow and tell me how you feel. Or come back in a month. Or for some, it's come back, and over this course of a year, we're going to try and figure out which therapy will work for you. I mean, that's insane. That's trial and error. So I got busy starting to learn about this industry of drug discovery and life sciences, and I found that for brain and heart diseases, a high percentage, 90 plus percent, of the drugs going to trial fail. And you know how I mentioned it was just really dangerous to do trial and error? The fourth leading cause of death in the United States it is adverse drug reactions. It kills a little over 100,000 people a year. 
And yet that pales in comparison to the millions who take medicines that are ineffective. And these are our best drugs. These are our FDA-approved drugs. So why is this? Well, we use these cute critters to figure out which compounds, which drugs will work on us in the early studies. And then in clinical trials, we use small homogeneous groups to predict a global, diverse population. I mean, a single drug now takes a dozen years and $2.6 billion. You could be 10 years into working on something and have it fail. It's amazing. There goes $2 billion. <laughs> There's got to be a better way. There has to be a way where you can more accurately test drugs and therapeutics to see if they will or will not work on us with much lower risk. And so I know you might be thinking, I'm, I'm in, still in that basement, right? <laughs> Imagine innovating and thinking. But the truth is, that's just a myth. To tackle a question that deep and detailed and diverse, it takes a multidisciplinary team, many of whom come from this university. As you can see, we have a lot of fun. As you can see, we're also a group of immigrants with extraordinary talents. And sometimes we even go surfing, but some better than others. And so we leverage some technology and work by Nobel Prize winning scientist Dr. Yamanaka, who came up with the ability to reprogram DNA of cells into stem cells, which are seen here, which, which we do. But then we take it the next step. We then convert those stem cells into brain cells, such as this mini brain. And they're so biologically accurate that even the neurons that you see are firing in our dishes and our plates. And we make beating heart cells. Now remember, these cells used to be skin. Pretty miraculous. But the truth is, this is not enough. This technology is not enough. Because if you're trying to find the handful of compounds out of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, you can't have one micro heart. You have to have many. And you can't have just one mini brain. You have to have gazillions. A real number, by the way. And you need this because you want to be able to find the failures as early as possible and not have these late stage failures, which costs billions of dollars. But we also learned that scale is not enough. Volume is not enough. And I'll explain here. This is heart tissue. And you can see that it is long rod-like structures going diagonally this way. And this ripple feature that you see are sarcomeres. And they're indicative of mature heart cells. But when you take stem cells, convert them into heart cells, and just put them onto an ordinary plate, you get this mess and this blob of cells. Nothing that looks like what's in all of us. And so you remember I mentioned we have a multidisciplinary team? Biologists, chemists, physicists, engineers, statisticians, process. In a matter of days, we then more recently have turned this into this, a structure that has the function and behavior like what's in us. And we do this for brain as well. So here you can see the green neurons and the red astrocytes. And astrocytes are cells that help provide structure as well as metabolic support. But then we also start combining biology with computer science and electrical engineering. So in this video, what you're seeing is a movie of those cells on a plate, a plate with electrodes on the bottom. And each square is a compartment. You can think of it as a compartment. And you'll notice in this mesmerizing video that each compartment, when it fires, each well fires together synchronously. 
And that's indicative, actually, of adult brain. So now you can imagine. We can take cells from a person's skin and actually convert it all the way to their organ cells. And it turns out when you do that, the disease that the person has is mimicked on that plate or dish. But it's remarkable, because now, and transformational, because now you can make a clinical trial of any population or sub-disease group and put it into a plate and have a clinical trial before the actual clinical trial years beforehand. But we can go beyond that. We can actually test populations that you would never have in a clinical trial, such as babies and pregnant women. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but it's possible. Here you're seeing above me at the top mature neurons. Below are precursor cells called uh, progenitors. Now, I mention this because we can create different levels of maturity, which are similar to different stages of brain development. Now, why is that important? Well, some of you know we have a global epidemic right now of Zika virus, which is transferred by mosquitoes. And so what we do is, what our neuronal team did, was they took the FDA-approved drugs that can work potentially for Zika, and they tested it across mature brain and developing brain. And the orange here represents cell toxicity or cell death. And you can see very clearly that for the progenitor cells, there's a lot more death across the board. So now you can start imagining that each one of these plates can re represent each one of us to create a person on a plate, if you will. Now, the question is, this cancer. Would I be standing here if I hadn't had cancer? It's kind of an interesting thought. Would I have formed the team with my co-founder? I don't think so. And so the truth is, cancer for me was totally transformational. transformational. It changed my relationship with my wife and daughter and family and friends. And the truth is, is that to survive cancer, as you can see, it truly takes a village. Now, I know some of you are smirking because my, my daughter is wearing pink in every <laughs> picture. And I wasn't BSing you, see, in that lower picture right there? She's wearing the pink ballerina outfit with a stethoscope. I wasn't BSing you. <laughs> it's true. But I had to learn something. I had to learn how to find opportunity in crisis. Opportunity in crisis. You know, when that doctor said to me, you might die today, or all the thoughts that go into your mind about the future that could negatively go wrong, I had to somehow calm my mind, find peace, find quiet. And it's really hard when you're always getting poked and prodded with chemo and radiation and its effects. But I'll share with you that what helped was to pray and meditate on what I was grateful for. Within a few minutes, when I would do that, I would calm down and find my quiet and be thankful for the present moment. The moment where you can actually affect those around you and the relationships we have. You know, it's kind of easy finding quiet when you're on chemo, because there's a lot of time to think. And that quiet could have made me mad. But the truth is, that quiet gave me the space to create and imagine what we're doing now. You know, I used to think that 
work hard and play hard were on opposite sides of the teeter-totter, and having both on opposite ends was balance. But after cancer, I learned that those two things are on the same side, the same side. And what's on the other side is non-effort, things like prayer, meditation, or just enjoying a sunset without interruption. And so many of you are on the edge of discovery, whether it's your field of study, yourselves, or the future you're trying to create. And the truth is, is that when you're at that edge of discovery, what's beyond has to be imagined. And if it's filled with smartphones and always being on and social media, you're not going to have the space to think and imagine and create. So I have a call to action, and it's simple. To do nothing. For me, I've continued the practice of meditation every morning for 20 and 30 minutes, but it started with a single minute. And for all of you, I find that some people might be able to find that quiet by taking a walk through nature. And when I say take a walk through nature, I don't mean this. <laughs> and so here's my last slide, and it's purposefully blank. And it's to share with all of you the thought that hopefully you can find some quiet amongst your daily routine. And hopefully you can find that space amongst the noise and madness. And hopefully, you can find that nothing, that nothing which could be the miracle that starts everything. Thank you. Namaste.